Hello and welcome to the video podcast series uh, by regionalfortrainees.com. Tune into learning. This podcast deals with the European Diploma in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Therapy, also known as EDRA. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is what this diploma is about. What are the benefits of probably doing this diploma? Uh, there are two parts to the exam, so we'll try and talk about individual parts. We'll talk about what are the requirements for appearing for these parts. We'll also try and touch upon the syllabus that is included. Although this is a good diploma, but then everything has its own limitations. Um, so we'll try and touch upon those. And at the end, whether you are giving this diploma or you're not giving this diploma, uh, what to do next? Uh, the assumption uh, is that the uh, uh, audience for this podcast is probably uh, a trainee who are uh, interested in doing regional anesthesia. So European Diploma in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Therapy is an exam which is conducted by the European Society uh, of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine annually. It was introduced first in 2005 and since then it has been an annual affair. Uh, it's taken as two-part exam. The first part is an MTK based exam consisting of 100 single best answers uh, over two hours and it's usually taken on the first day of the annual conference. Whereas the second part uh, is a 30-minute Viva based practical station taken by examiners uh, and this is usually conducted a day before the annual conference. Uh, at the end of both the parts, uh, you are given a title of EDRA, uh, and the regulations um, and the syllabus is set forth by the ESRA committee uh, or the ESRA board. Uh, what could be the benefits of uh, appearing for this exam? First that comes to the mind is that this is an international certification in regional anesthesia and pain therapy. It's still establishing itself, uh, but it's definitely better than having uh, nothing at all. Uh, it's getting popular. So last year this exam was taken by about 200 trainees from different countries, including Philippines, USA. But most of the trainees come from uh, the United Kingdom itself, more than half of them being from the UK. Uh, the society is uh, supported by ASRA, which is the American counterpart, the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, and that can't be a bad thing, although I can't see any direct benefits. Um, you, can, uh, you need to basically prepare for the exam, and therefore you read a lot of stuff, uh, which you end up learning as well, hopefully. Um, the competition is getting tough all the time. So you need something up your sleeve to make sure that you've got that job at the end of the day. And the good thing about the diploma is that you can do it by being just at whatever hospital that you are at. Um, so if you are not interested in doing the diploma, what alternatives do you have? You could probably apply for fellowships, uh, whether that is in Europe or elsewhere. Uh, but the problem with fellowships is that uh, they are very limited, so there could be one or two fellowships at, at a given place and you may apply for it but might not end up getting it. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't go out there and try to achieve something else. There are a couple of other MSc programs coming up, although I've got no knowledge um, uh, about their details. So I know that they exist, so that's one option that you could explore. Uh, you could learn tips and tricks by just uh, attending workshops uh, and that's probably a very simplistic approach uh, to learning regional anesthesia and there could be other options uh, what things do you need to take the part one exam which is an MCQ based exam first of all you need to be a member of the ESRA you could either be a full member or a trainee member um, you need to have finished at least two years uh, as NITHIS in your country um, and you should have attended at least one workshop in the last three years which is approved by the ESRA board. Um, and then once you have all of these requisites you can purchase the annual conference um, as, uh, registration and uh, you'll have to attend the conference to give the exam. For the part two uh, the first uh, two remains the same, however, you should have successfully passed 
part one exam um, and you also have to take this exam at the annual conference from different times at different times the um, ESRA website would um, give details of different requisites for part one and part two um, and I would probably recommend you guys to go back to esraeurope.org the website uh, the official website to check what the details are for the part two exam there the syllabus is fairly detailed and extended um, and uh, recently uh, they've released an extended four-page syllabus uh, for the exam. The part one in a sense consists of anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, procedures, physics of ultrasound and other equipments, statistics, pain, pathophysiology, surgery related questions, equipments and so on. Whereas part two examines you on your attitudes, safety, behavior, procedural skills, sterility, station, complication, side effects and specific population um, um, and so on. Everything about uh, the exam may not be A1. Um, you could be limited by the requirements. You might not be eligible to give the exam in the first place. Secondly, uh, there's a lot of cost involved. So uh, you have to plan your finances as well. Uh, and the cost would include the cost of membership, the cost of preparing for the exam, cost of purchasing books, that is, preparing for the exam, uh, cost of uh, applying for a visa if you need one and costs of going to whichever country the exam has been conducted in. Um, there can be failures. Um, in the last couple of years the success rate for the exam was slightly on the higher side. Uh, the, the exam has been toughened uh, and that has reduced the success rate to about 60-70% although this is not the official figure. Uh, and I can't really find much teaching available. There are a couple of courses uh, available uh, in the UK uh, but then uh, there's not much teaching available in preparation for this exam. And on the other side it doesn't necessarily mean that because you've taken the exam you've taught yourself or you've learned uh, everything about regional anesthesia. Uh, there's no particular modality of teaching available at this point of time. There's no online modules that you have to complete and so on. So there is no ensured teaching uh, with this diploma. So it's just another exam that you can take uh, but not necessarily uh, go through. It's not a process that you go through. What next? So you need to decide what you're going to plan and what you need uh, uh, to do. If you decide that you are willing to take the exam then you need to plan plan and plan you'll have to plan your membership you'll have to plan what workshops you can attend whether they are approved or not the exams itself and the visa the expenses uh, and how do you go about attending some courses that will help you preparing for the exam itself uh, however if you think that this exam is not for you then what is your alternative and then you can go back uh, to the slides that I have shown to you earlier on and then think on those lines maybe that will uh, give you some tips on how to proceed next that is it thank you this is the video podcast series by regionalfortrainees.com